I wish people knew how important family is. And I don't mean family in the sense of biological family only, but the family that you surround yourself with, like close friends and your academic mentors, because they really, really do pull you out of a deep, dark hole. And, you know, going through everything that I've gone through, celebrating the heights of becoming a National Geographic Explorer, which is something I didn't dream I would do. But here we are. And, you know, your family is there to celebrate those wins for you and to help you through the hard times. I want to be like, okay, cool, we can do great things, amazing things, but you really do have to appreciate the people that helped you get there. Raise people as you rise. Other people raised you. And so you have to acknowledge that. And that's just a wholesome feeling. Hello and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, your host, and I'm also the host of the Goodness Exchange, a website where for a decade we've been getting positive news out to curious people. Yes, it is still an amazing world out there. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows enough about yet. And on this podcast, every week, you're going to hear from people in that wave. We're here to shine a light on what's right with the world. And we're going to get started with that today with an amazing guest, Dr. Kaneloe Malopeani. Dr. Malopiani is a National Geographic Explorer. She's a lecturer at the School of Geography, Archaeology, and Environmental Science at Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. And she is an explorer, an archaeologist, bioanthropologist, and a paleoanthropologist. And we're going to understand what all that means in a few minutes. But most of all, what we're going to understand is how someone's childhood passions can turn into dreams and aspirations, and then eventually change the world. And I know that we're going to see our own story in the story she relates about how she became one of the foremost paleoarchaeologists in, in Africa and in our modern world right now, studying the deep origins of humanity. She studies things like human artifacts and human fossils. And I was first ran across her work in a National Geographic documentary about an amazing cave in South Africa called the Rising Star Cave. And that story is unto itself an amazing journey. But since then, my both my daughter and I have kept track of Dr. Malpiani's work. And she is doing even more amazing things in a site called number 105. So we're going to have her talk talk to us about that work, but also her journey and all the things she's learned along the way, because her story is probably related to our own. If we just open up a little bit and listen for the cues that, you know, bring us all to new places. So welcome, Dr. Malapayani. Hi, Linda. How are you? I'm so good. I I just so enjoyed our uh, pre-call chat a week ago. I couldn't wait to get on and record with you today. You're, we're talking from South Africa to the United States. I'm about an hour south of Montreal in uh, Vermont. And so if there's some baubles in our reception here, bear with us. <laughs> We've already, let's see, we started trying to get this interview going about an hour and a half ago. So we finally, yeah, we <laughs> we're finally, finally on progress. track. You've got a great story about how you've become so well respected in your field and uh, and doing so much good work. So why don't you, you know, why don't you take us back to the beginning? Because you don't get to where you are in the scientific world without mm -hmm. some serendipity, some accident of birth, some perfect timing, some great other people that showed up on the scene right when you needed them. So tell us about your story. I, I think it's just a lovely reminder of what's possible. Yeah, my story began a very long time ago, 1987, I was born. But then my my career story really started when I was seven years old, watching a cartoon with my mum. And that cartoon was The Adventures of Tintin. Cigars of the Pharaoh was the name of the episode. And I was just, I was drawn to Tintin's character and his tenacity into exploring different worlds, civilizations that were very different from his and recording that history of those individuals, of those peoples and his 
adventures with his with his friend Captain Haddock and his dog Snowy. And I remember turning to my mom, who was watching the cartoon with me just before going off to work, and I was like, ah, I I want to do that. I want to do what Tintin does, and. You know, I think I think mom should have turned to me and said, oh, you want to be a journalist? Because that's what Tintin was. He was a journalist and he was writing stories and telling these stories for, for other people to follow. But I don't, I don't know why. And I think I, I owe mom a visit this weekend to ask her what prompted her to say the word archaeologist because she said, oh, you want to become an archaeologist? And I was like... Yes, if that's what Tintin is, that is what I want to do. And since then, I've just been like so embossed and engrossed in the the story and the idea of archaeology, which is taking a time long gone where there's no survivors, no living voices to tell the story of that of that time. And you are then now tasked to telling their story to future generations. I mean, I didn't think of it so elegantly back then, but, you know, that's what it's become. It's it's sort of becoming a, a time traveler, going back into time, getting a glimpse, like a very brief glimpse into other people's lives and then retelling that story of who they are, what they were and what they experienced in order to help us shape our future. Wow. That's lovely. You had a couple of good night, good breaks there, you know, that you had a moment where you're watching a a Saturday morning cartoon Mm -hmm. and your mom happened to be sitting beside you. First, she had happened to be the kind of mom that would do that. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's definitely that mom. My parents both are, 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 those parents they're both medical doctors right so they're very much into ed- education so that was on the top of the list and they got that from my grandparents my grandparents were very much into you know you go to school you get a good education and things will turn out better for you but I yeah. think my parents added the cherry to the top in that okay yeah you can get a good education but what are your passions? Like, what are you interested in? And let's feed into that. And I'm so blessed to have a family like that who who feeds off of passion and we all support each other in our passions. I mean, myself with archaeology, my brothers with sports and and IT and gaming. Yeah, it's it's beautiful to see. A lot of that is accident of birth. You wonder how many, how many great people we've missed because they didn't get a mom like yours or an mm. environment. They didn't land in an environment that would support this kind of level of curiosity. But you know, there's an awful lot of good, important thought leaders in the world who tell the story of you know meeting just that one great mentor. Yeah, that took them to the next level. You talked about when I mentioned the role of others, you talked about an accounting teacher and an English teacher who believed in your dream. Yeah, I think you said to me, you said you actually remember saying to yourself, I'm going to be the first African black (laughs) female archaeologist. Yeah, I oh my god. Okay. It's like, it's a cringe moment, kind of, you know, like I've I've always been interested in in archaeology and the ancient world. So a lot of my school oral presentations were centered around that. And again, I've I've been very fortunate in there've been one or two teachers that were really interested in the in the subject. One being my accounting teacher, Jan, whom I met in grade 10, who was really, really interested in the ancient world which is something you wouldn't expect from an accounting teacher, right? Like you'd expect that he would encourage me to go into accountancy because, of course, that would support my parents' career as doctors and now take care of their accounts. But that didn't happen. And, you know, he sort of encouraged me to go to the library and pick up books. And then, of course, there was my English teacher, Mrs. Robin Clark. She was eccentric, and she was all for the ancient world. So she really, really encouraged that. And it was in my matric year. I'm not sure what it's like in the U.S. system in your final year of high school. 
uh, you go through the set of exams or yeah. tests. And so I had an oral presentation for English and I presented on archaeology and my dreams and goals for, for the future. And I naively, at the time as an 17 year old 18 year old would do i was like i'm gonna do this whole archaeology thing and i'm gonna be the first South african black female to be an archaeologist and you know i i think about that statement now and i'm like that is ridiculous in 2005 <laughs> you think you're going to be the first black south african female like what the hell but you know, even though I didn't turn out to be the first Black South African female to, to become an archaeologist in South Africa, something else happened. I mean, I still need to get the, the data to verify, but so far the rumors seem to be true and that I became the first Black South African female to hold the title of Principal Investigator for the Cradle of Humankind. So wow. all in all, what that means is that I'm the first black woman in South Africa to be the boss lady for research at a particular site in, in the Cradle of Humankind, which is both amazing and fantastic and quite an honor to hold, um, a huge responsibility. But also it's, it's sad that, you know, it happened in 2021. Right. Yeah. So I got to I got to take a little journey, take folks down a little side journey of something you talked to me about in our pre-call that that fits right here that I didn't know about. You talked about the the changing the parachute scientist paradigm. Mm -hmm. I never realized this, but I got goosebumps. I remember when you talked about talk to us about what's been happening prior to most recent years about parachute scientists. Yeah, so if we if we take a look at archaeology and paleoanthropology in Africa and Southern Africa in particular, this is a science that hasn't exactly been open to Africans as leading figures. Let's put it that way. We've always been the assistants. We've never been the leaders. A lot of the thought leaders, if you think about it, like Robert Broom, even Lee Berger, as much as I love him, they're not South African born. They might have been nationalized into being South African, but they're not South African born. So a lot of our researchers and knowledge base or ground has come from individuals from outside of the African continent who've made Africa their, their home. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a movement into shifting that transformation into making African born scientists as thought leaders and and researchers going forward and so that's okay. the whole idea of of demolishing parachute scientists demolishing the whole idea that western scientists could come onto the continent do the studies and not actually leave anything behind for indigenous peoples to reflect on and then just leave and you know there's nothing left behind so one of the, the big things that Professor Berger has been quite central on is coming in, even though he considers himself a South African, and most of us consider him a South African, coming in and sharing his knowledge and experiences with early career scientists in South Africa so that we could be like the next step in going forward and creating another huge science academy that could put indigenous scientists not just africa but indigenous scientists yes. as the thought leaders for what is happening on their continent mm. Mm. perfect so knowing that we go back to we go back to your story <laughs> so i mentioned that i i got familiar with your work through the documentary the rising star cave which we'll put a link to mm. but you have this great ted talk that i came across as well about how we've got to make our own way, find our own path, do the work. Tell us a little bit about the, the the message that you're bringing forward in that TED Talk, because you've had a very important scientific breakthrough or two about how to do the science 20 years after everybody thinks it was already done. Yeah, so not a lot of people will know this or would have grasped this from that TED Talk because it looks so good. They made the edits look 
amazing. Like I knew what I was doing. But really that that talk stemmed from my own insecurities. Um, so, <laughs> so, so Oh, that old problem. Yeah. So one of my, my major funders, Genus Paleosciences for Africa, they sort of called me up one day and they're like, listen, we want to, you to give a, a TED Talk. And I was like, oh, I don't think I can do it because I'm not a leading figure in paleoanthropology or archaeology. I'm just starting out. Like I just... I just finished my PhD. I just got this grant and I just opened up this new site in which I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't have anything to talk about in comparison to anyone else that you could ask you right. to give a, a talk. And they're like, no, your voice is important. And so because I felt like I didn't have anything great in terms of discoveries to share, I decided to share my insecurities in failing as an early career scientist, which is very, very scary. And I think it's what we all go through, but I decided to, to talk about it into saying that, listen, I'm, I'm a person, a girl from Benoni who is doing this career that no black woman would do uh, willingly. And I'm going into a space which had already been research extensively for like 20 years and a lot of people say that everything that could be done at Gladysville has been done so that's the name of my research site Gladysville Cave in the Cradle of Humankind and so I spoke about you know my insecurities my unsureties of making a huge discovery but it was really going through that that process of putting a team together learning what it's like to have uh, expedition team and organizing them that I made it a big discovery for me in, in, in a way in that I learned how to become a leader and often that is being in the trenches with, with everyone else and this, this amazing fossil came out of, of the ground of which we're still studying now and it turns out to be one of the first that came out of Glaswell in that 30 years of exploration at at that site and so that was that was very incredible for me but also that moment in 2022 i think it was and when when i did the tedx talk and where i am now is that i've sort of shifted my approach to glasswell cave in that it's not the site that i'm gonna make my biggest and hugest discovery but it's a site where i i build character and i learn what needs to be learned in order to take the next step nice nice and you know there's a lot of risk taking here yeah. in your story <laughs> i mean that's another thing you said to me in that i wrote down you said i think you were referring to this first this adventure with the rising star cave you said it was the biggest risk i've ever taken but boy did it really pay off yeah. So talk to us about the, the story around that, that first big risk and how it led to, to where you're at now. Yeah, um, I've taken a lot of risks in my career, actually. So I started off as, you know, an undergrad archaeology student. So I was doing the whole traditional archaeology. And then during my third year of undergraduate studies, I decided I don't want to do artifacts anymore. I don't want to study artifacts. I want to study the people who who made these artifacts, who, who, you know, incorporated them into their real lives. And essentially what I was saying is I wanted to do human bones. And, you know, I, I said this to my advisors at the time, and, and one of them, or two actually, really, really took me seriously. And they're like, okay, they place opportunities in front of me. And in order for me to get to where I am, I had to like take that risk of stepping away from what the rest of the class was doing, which was stone tools and pottery, you know, stuff like that, and doing bones, but not just animal bones, but human bones. And that has been the consistent thing. You know, I went from an honors dealing with human remains from an archaeological site to writing fan mail to a professor in the UK, Professor Joanne Fletcher, 
and then landing up doing my master's in the UK. So moving from Southern Africa to the United Kingdom, that was a big step because I was away from family and friends and, you know, I'd be on my own in this foreign country. Um, to then moving back to South Africa and then making another big jump to going underwater and doing underwater archaeology. You know, that that's something I wasn't trained for at university, but it sounded exciting and I did it. And it was fun, as terrifying as it was and as stressful as diving is, it was fun. And because I did that, later on, in my PhD, it would it would pay off in that because I had managed to to show the capability of working in stressful situations, I was then a perfect candidate to work in the Rising Star Cave system. And you know, it was that experiences underwater that led me to the Rising Star Cave system, and then from there that sort of led to, okay, she has leadership qualities. Let's see what she could do. And then UW105 happened. And then Gladys Vale happened. So it all came with taking that one risk of opening your mouth and taking the opportunity that was given to you. Wow. Yeah. Now, we haven't talked too much about the actual physical risk, (laughs) but a lot of your your studies are done in deep caves, in Mm. very... I don't know, very uncomfortable places oh, under yeah. the ground. <laughs> oh, yeah. Give us a little bit of that part of the journey because not everybody's cut out to be a caver. You can be the, a maniac scientist and just be stricken with claustrophobia mm-hmm. or whatever, but mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some risk about the pure caving aspect of becoming a scientist underground that you had to pull up some serious courage for. Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if I take the rising star cave system, which is one of the three sites that I work at in the Cradle of Humankind, from the mouth of the cave to one of the most scientifically prominent chambers within that cave system is called Dina Lady. And that is maybe about, what, 200, 300 meters away from the mouth of the cave. So okay. we have individuals in the world like Usain Bolt and my brother who could sprint that distance in about nine seconds flat, right? But for for us as a team, depending on who's on the team, it could take us between 25 to 30 minutes or 35 minutes to get from point A to point B. That's because of how dangerous and difficult the route is. I mean, you're going through very tight channels and passages and tunnels and you're climbing up 20 meters it's intense it's absolutely intense but again i think i think it goes to some sort of some part of my personality where i'm a bit of a psycho and i love the adrenaline rush and there is just something that pumps in you that keeps you going and as i transition from the mouth of the cave to Superman's crawl, which is one section of of the route to Dinner Lady. And then from Superman's crawl, you go into Dragon's Back, the Dragon's Back chamber, which is where we we put on our harnesses and we get ready to climb about 20 meters up on the Dolomite Ridge. And when you're in that chamber, which I've just recently been leading excavations at, you Oh, well, I at least, I speak for myself. I feel very, very warm, very, very hot. And either the temperature in that chamber has risen from 18 degrees to like 150 degrees Celsius, or it's the adrenaline that's pumping through you, knowing what you just went through and what you're about to go through. Because at the end of Dragon's Back is the shoot labyrinth. And the smallest point in the shoot labyrinth is like about 18 centimeters in width, which is shorter than your standard ruler. And I'm just like, yes. ah, but it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it was, it was fun, but also I'm getting older now. So I'm just like, one day I won't be able to do this. 
Well, I tell you, you know, what we're talking about is a lot of courage that you that you probably get from your just pure sense of, it sounds like you have a level of curiosity that's quite extraordinary too. Is it a li- is it a sense of curiosity or just being really, really stubborn? I mean, like, I think it's, oh. I think it's both, right? Like I'm very, very curious and I want to like explore a little bit and then I try to, and then there are some instances in which I can't. And I'm like, what do you mean I can't? I'm going to yeah. try, like, I will, I will try until like, I physically cannot do it. So it's a combination right. of like curiosity and just being absolutely stubborn. That goes back to something you said in our pre-call that really just stuck with me. You said the dreams that you had as a child were real and pure. With sheer determination, those dreams can come true. Yeah. This is the gist of your story, I think. So maybe it wasn't courage. Maybe it was just so much determination. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. So tell me about the difference. Let's go back to the, the science here. So we, mm. we can all appreciate the depth of, of learning and understanding that you're offering the rest of us. Talk to us about the cradle of humankind versus the cradle of mankind and why it matters. Because this is kind of a fascinating thing if, if you're an outsider to archaeology. I, I, please explain that to us. Right, right. So if you remember in the 1700s and the 1800s, as if you were there, we sort of like were introduced to the concept that humans weren't just humans. We haven't always just been there. Yeah, we, we have the creation story, but then there are things that just weren't making sense in nature, that it wasn't just boom, yeah, we, we're here, there's something, there's there's a process behind it into becoming who we are as humans. And so scientists at the time, anthropologists, people who study humans were quite interested in, in that aspect. And so this is the early days of paleoanthropology and archaeology. And so there's this difference between archaeology and paleoanthropology, which not a lot of people know about. So archaeology is the study of human history and prehistory through excavation and the analysis of artifacts that we we get from these these sites. Paleoanthropology sort of takes archaeology a little bit deeper, going back into deep time. So we're looking at our deep human journey, trying to really trace back our human origin roots, Okay, what it, what does it mean to be human? Where do we come from? And by saying where do we come from, I'm now diving back into the cradle of humankind and the cradle of mankind. And these both are located on the African continent. So the cradle of mankind is found in East Africa or is associated to being with East Africa where some very early hominid or hominin fossil remains have been recovered so hominins such as lucy the famous lucy were recovered there by the leaky family and don johansson and so that's one of the the sites or the areas of the african continent that speak to early human evidence and then in 1924 the tahung child was found in southern africa in the town of Tahum, uh, which is in the northwest. It's about 45 minutes from where I am seated right now. And it's funny because this year we celebrate 100 years of discovery, since its discovery uh, in South Africa. And it became a very, very important fossil because the discovery of the Tahum child and then subsequently Mrs. Place, which is also in the cradle of humankind in Southern Africa, southern africa which is a region in gauteng which preserves the best fossil remains that tell the story of our deep human journey these two fossils were found here and then of course a couple of 10 12 dozen more were located but what these fossils did is that they sort of refocused humanity's idea of civilization modernity and where humans came from because back in the 1800s and 1900s it was thought that you know all modern humans stemmed from europe 
And that's where civilization came from. It came from Europe. Of course it did. Africa's barbaric. What, what do they have to contribute to us other than providing you with your mineral wealth? But, you know, what with the discovery of the Taiwan child in 1924 and Mrs. Place in 1947 did, in conjunction to all the fossils that came from East Africa, is that they showed the earliest traces of what it means to be human, you know, like our ancestors. These are creatures that were both primitive and modern at the same time. And so with the discovery of these of these primates or the, of these hominids, they sort of indicated that, you know, modern life or humans as as we know of them today originated from this continent of Africa. So we should no longer be considered as having nothing to contribute to the world, but we actually contribute quite a lot, a bit more than our mineral resources. We contribute ourselves. You know, this is where we find ourselves. And also this stems back to the importance of African scientists taking back the narrative in telling our own stories. I mean, sure, we have our Western scientists counterparts coming in and we appreciate the the knowledge that they have but really i think the story comes to life in a very very different way if it's an african telling that story absolutely so is there a difference in the way fossils are preserved just because of the environment between so the cradle of humankind is in south africa yeah and the cradle of mankind is in east africa yeah why, why does it matter? What, what's the difference? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure there's environmental conditions that preserve fossils different in each. Anything else? I mean, yeah, it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> like, it, yeah. it really doesn't. It's, it's like this whole thing of, oh, I have the oldest fossil and you don't. I'm like, no, you don't. I have. It doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> like we're telling okay, the same matter. story. Like, come on. Like, yeah. eh, it really doesn't matter. We're all telling the this the single story of what it means to be human, but there are environmental differences in terms of preservation of these fossils, where preservation is very different in East Africa. I mean, they have volcanoes, volcanic ash, in which they preserve their fossils or aid in their their dating in comparison to what we have in the cradle of humankind which is largely dolomitic caves in just one section of, of, the, of the country. And this is not to say that there aren't other areas of the country that, you know, preserve hominin fossils. It's very much likely the case, and there have been like one or two cases. But it tends to be within Gauteng that, you know, you have this region of cave systems that seem to preserve these fossils really, really well. And they really tell a very good story of our deep human journey. And I think the whole concept of the cradle of humankind and cradle of mankind hopefully will one day fall away and that Africa's actually considered the cradle of the deep human journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the important part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to learn more from this amazing new rising force in archaeology and the human story. You know how the constant negative noise in our digital lives feels like it's reaching a boiling point? Now, many of us have tuned out the news and social media almost entirely. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. There are newsworthy stories about amazing progress, innovation, leaps in human potential, and wonders in the natural world, and they're just not reaching the top of our feeds. We can have access to this, but none of us has the time or maybe even the emotional stamina to search through all the doom and gloom news to find what's right with the world. Okay, enter the Goodness Exchange. There, we are giving instant access to positive news for curious people. Did you hear about the recent Harvard study that found that exposure to just four minutes of good news can make you 32% less anxious and 18% more optimistic? Well, I don't know about you, but I need those kind of numbers in my life. So if you want to live with more joy and way less fear, it's really simple. 
First, you join us at the Goodness Exchange. Everyone around the world has the opportunity to access this kind of content. And we've promised no politics for about a decade, so you're safe from all that distraction as well. Second, you allow this new, more positive, balanced worldview to put a spring in your step again. It can change the way you react to your kids, your coworkers, everybody you come in contact with. And the stories we write about can make you the idea person in your circles. These challenging times call for us to wake up and take control of our perspective. The people who use the Goodness Exchange have the ability to react to the harshness of the world much different because they know way more about what's right with the world. And that's a resource. So subscribe to the Goodness Exchange, our YouTube channel and the podcast, and use this content to live a more expansive worldview. It is still an amazing world out there and you can be a part of it. Welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness. All right, we're back with Dr. Mala Payani, who is a National Geographic explorer. She's a lecturer. She is an archaeologist, a bioanthropologist, and a paleoanthropologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many <laughs> ologists here. <laughs> Can anyway, one of the things I'm most curious about is one of the points in your TED Talk, where you're talking about doing some work and excavating a cave that had been excavated up to good par and standards and best practices 20 or more years ago, yeah. but going back in there and finding there was more to discover. And it made me think that, you know, it really is about just doing the work yourself, bringing your particular eyeballs to it and your particular experiences. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what we can learn from your experience with that. So the, the theme of my TEDx talk was talking about Glasswell Cave, which for quite some time I had seen as my breakthrough in, in the science of paleosciences. This is my first ever site. This was the site where I became the first black South African woman to hold the title of principal investigator. So it was a very, very big deal. And I was going to go into it after having inherited, in inverted commas, it from my predecessor, Professor Lee Berger, and him from Philip Tobias. So I was really expecting to come away with it, with something major and, and would be life altering. It didn't turn out that way so far in that, I haven't found, you know, that elusive one hominin that's rumored to, to being in the cave. But what has stemmed from it is, I mean, I just, I, I literally came through this, this breakthrough came in uh, a week ago, actually. Is that glad as well? It's not the, the cave where I make the big discoveries, but it's the cave where I and many others in the past, after doing the research on previous work that had been done there, is that we're building character at that, at that site. We're yes. building our science. We're building what makes us great. And it's, it's a great learning platform for that because there's so many fossils for that and there's so many mm -hmm. opportunities. And so I've sort of changed my outlook and that Gladyswell is not the site where I make the big discovery physically but it's the site where i make a huge discovery of myself as as a scientist and as a teacher and mentor because we myself and professor lee berger we recruit and hire local community members to work with us working on the science at the site you know come back in the whole parachute science sort of thing you know getting the locals to know about their own fossil heritage and being in control of that of that narrative so it's it's a huge learning it's been a huge learning experience and I mean there was this this one thing that Professor Berger said to me in the early days when we we're planning the expedition and planning out all my science communication commitments in 2021 2022 and this is a message that i think a lot of my mentors have sort of tried to install in me but professor berger is really the one who actually said it out loud is that as you rise 
you got to raise others with you. And so that's that's been the thing that, you know, as you move up the ranks, small or, or large, try help others, you know, also progress with you. And so that's that's what Gladysville is. It's it's not it's not a site of, you know, huge groundbreaking discoveries, even though I, I don't want to manifest that, but it it's actually a site that that builds people. I think that's yes, that's what that's it right. is. It builds people. And you know, I think it's important to recognize those times in life when we're that are just character building. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a, a job that you have to keep for some reason or another and it's not your dream job or maybe far from it, but there's character building happening there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, right? Right? Yeah. It's it's being able to watch your kids struggle through something on their own without helicoptering in and seeing they them evolve from a struggle and so yeah. forth. So I, I love that point in your story. Okay. Can't let this interview go by without you talking to us about the super scientist project. Yeah. Oh my God. I love this. That's like my favorite. That's my favorite project on, on my table so far. So super scientist is a nonprofit organization started by Dr. Justin Yero who's an incredible guy and he came up with the concept of recreating scientists not just paleo scientists but scientists across the broad as superheroes like Marvel style superheroes and most importantly as people that are relatable to the children in the region that, you know, these comics or these scientists are reaching out towards. So I knew of super scientists in 2020 around there, but I I never thought that I would be one of them. I always dreamed that I'd be, you know, in in the crew. You know, at the time I was a postdoc student, a postdoctoral student, just finishing my PhD I was also a curator at a museum and I was doing a lot of science communication. So one evening I got a a message from Instagram from Justin and he was like, are you interested to talk? I'd really love to talk to you. So very, very similar to my National Geographic news where people are like, hey, we want to talk to you. And then you get on a call with them and like, we think you're awesome. We want to offer you this. So Justin was like, I think you're awesome. You're doing amazing things. I'd really like to have you drawn up as a super scientist for archaeology. And of course, I was like, my mind was blown away. And so we started talking about some ideas for creating a character that would represent archaeology and paleoanthropology as well as people of color in, in the sciences. So I came up with the character Bones. Don't know if you can see her in my card here. So that is my character Bones. She looks very much like me with the red hair. So from from creating the character Bones, Justin was like, okay, are there are there any other people that you think I should be aware of? And again, this this stems to the whole mantra of raise others as you rise yourself. And so I threw in a couple of names in the hat of fellow friends and colleagues that I knew were doing great in paleo sciences that could really contribute to the transformation of the science. And so I called upon some of my friends and, you know, they, they fit the profile. And, you know, Clyde Beach, who's an amazing Southern African animation artist, he drew us up as like Marvel characters and we became like the paleo sciences crew. <laughs> and, you know, we have posters and trading cards, even yeah. have a, a comic book. We, we launched a comic book focused on paleo sciences and the cradle of humankind in South Africa, which was well received by the academic community. And then moving beyond that, we had exhibitions, museum exhibitions. And now one of my favorite projects is that we're working towards creating an animation series. 
So we've just started putting together a pilot episode for a cartoon show about the super scientists and an episode on the paleo sciences. And hopefully that will grow to to the other fields of science that the super scientists organization covers. And it's, it's an incredible story because it almost comes full circle in a way in that um, my journey into my career started off with a cartoon series and now I have a character that might become a cartoon that might inspire someone else. That is extraordinary. The serendipity there um, (laughs) in in the through line is just, it's too marvelous to ignore. Thank you so much for sharing that part of your journey. And, you know, it all goes back to that little girl who said that to herself so long ago. I'm trying to look for the quote really quick, not to embarrass you again. I'm going to be the first African black female archaeologist. (laughs) And I know, I know, I know, but it hurts. But it reminds us that we were all seven once. We were all 12 once. We were all awkward 19 year olds once. Mm -hmm. We could still have this dream, but, oh, there's this great story. You have to share it. You talked about the first person that you worked under. Alex Scamone? Yeah. I'm not sure. But there's this great story about you worrying more about your nails <laughs> than, <laughs> but, <laughs> than you should have. But this, this person saw something in, in you. <laughs> Tell us about that little chapter. Oh, my gosh. Like, if, if Mama Alex is, is watching this now, like, just know my cheeks are also red. Um, <laughs> so I was... It's I was such gonna... a great story, though. Because because we all have nineteen year olds, we have our kids, or our nieces and nephews, and they're saying one thing but doing another, and but we can get there from from where we are, yeah. anywhere we are. So tell us about the story. Yeah, yeah. So I was in my first year of university. I finally got into the archaeology program, and as a part of the archaeology program, Professor Skuman, Alex Skuman, she really is like my mom, in in the academic sphere. But she had a site that needed to be excavated and she was willing, and I think that's very important, she was willing to allow undergraduates to come onto her site and to learn how to dig. And that's that's very important. And I see it so much now as a lecturer in the, the School of Geography, Archaeology and Environmental Studies is that we can give our students, all the knowledge, all the book knowledge. But if we don't give them the practical stuff, we're not creating a new generation of archaeologists. We're just creating a generation of bookworms. So Alex came from from the tradition of vets where they went out into the field and they did excavations. And so she installed that at, at Tucky's University of Pretoria, which I did my undergraduate at. And so she opened up her, her site for undergraduates and I signed up. And I'm 19 at this point, 19 years old. I'm a city kid, but I'm very, very determined to be an archaeologist. I've never held a trowel in my hand. And there I am in the middle of the wilderness. And Alex is such a badass, like Laura <laughs> Croft 2.0, dude. And... She she looks at me and she like like she looks at me. I'm not dressed to the part. My nails are done and now I have to dig in the dirt. And she's like, what the hell am I gonna do with this girl? Like, why is she here? Um <laughs> but for I, I don't know what happened, but I picked up the trowel and you know, she taught me how to dig, how to use it. And At the end of the week, she said that I had the most beautiful profile sections and excavation that she had seen in a very, very long time from a first-year undergrad student. And from that moment, she decided to to take me on as a mentee to teach me everything that she knew. And she did that from from first year right up to my third year where I told her I was interested in, in human bones And then she went above and beyond to get me a fourth year project that involved human remains that would help me gain the skills to being the person that I was 
to help me get to the United Kingdom for my master's, to being in Cape Town on shipwrecks and then calling me back to Joburg to, to lecture, to be like one of few black female, I think I'm two black females to, to teach undergraduate students at, at Wits University. She's played a huge role in my life in that she's always been there, even though I've made some decisions where she's just like, hmm, I don't think you should be doing that. Like, you know, like a mom would do, but she lets you do it. And she's, I think the important thing is both her and Professor Lee Berger, who's almost like, like my dad in some sense academically, is that they, they let you do what your heart wants to do in terms of your career, but they are there to catch you if you fall and they let you know that it's okay to fall and to fail. We're here to help you. And that's what success is. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if we can do any better than wrapping up on that note. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, your world is expansive, given that you have to live in everyday life just like we do in the real world. But also you have this window on ancient people's lives. Mm. You know, I'm sure when you listen to the news or have to get stuck in social media, some terrible place or whatever, I'm sure your life has taught you something that you really wish people knew. Do you have something like that sometimes you, you just want to put your face in your hands and say, I just really wish people knew what? I wish people knew how important family is. And I don't mean family in, in the sense of biological family only, but the family that you surround yourself with, like friends, close friends, and your academic mentors, because they really, really do pull you out of a deep, dark hole. It's through the academic family and my own personal family that I've become the person that I am in terms of my career. They've pulled me through a lot of hardships living abroad I mean I was I wasn't even 25 years old when I was living in the UK by myself and you know it, it was having that strong ties and you know going through everything that I've gone through celebrating the heights of becoming a National Geographic explorer which is something I didn't dream I would do but here we are and you know your family is there to celebrate those wins for you and to help you through the hard times it's, it's almost like I want to be like, okay, cool, we can do great things, amazing things, but you really do have to appreciate the people that helped you get there. Again, yeah. raise people as you rise. Other people raised you, and so you have to acknowledge that. And that's just a wholesome I, feeling. I love that. Raise people as you rise. That That is... That's just a fundamental truth. Thank yeah. you so, so much. This interview is part of many, many that we've done with folks who have lived, who have a lived experience that really feels connected to, to everyone else's. Thank you so much for sharing all those personal details and some of the personal embarrassment <laughs> <laughs> so gracefully, but we all have those stories. Yeah. <laughs> Can I right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Dr. Malapiani is a growing force in the scientific world that we will hear more and more from. I can't thank you enough for sharing your life journey and the insights you've come across, even some of them. We will keep an eye on things. I will reiterate that the article, there will be a full article built around this interview on the website at the Goodness Exchange, and we will fill it full of all kinds of links. I'm going to get get you to send that card with your, with your superhero oh, yeah. character on it. So we'll put that in the article. You won't be able to find those details where you normally get podcasts, so visit us. The website is free for the world, and visit us at the Goodness Exchange to see more about Dr. Manapaliani's work, and I certainly hope that you'll come back and chat with us again after the next big breakthrough oh uh, of course and you know what i'm gonna put this out into the universe because i'm very much into manifestation and working towards it something big is coming up please and i'll share it with I, you 
Okay. All right. All right. I want to be there first. Thank you so much. I hope the insights and the joy and the wonder that Dr. Malapiani and I have talked about today will carry you through your week and you will walk with a spring in your step and an eye on some future dream of your own. Thanks. Thank you.